Hello and welcome to the Ideal Spaces podcast. I'm your host, Flora Lockridge, and I'm joined today by my co-host and director of Ideal Spaces, Ulrich Giemann. Hello, nice to see you. Today we'll be speaking to the American architect, Sam Olshin, for what I know is going to be a very, very rich discussion about placemaking for communities and also about how architecture can best be used to support people and make them a bit more resilient to life's challenges and pressures of change. Sam is a principal at Atkin Olshin Shade Architects, an architecture firm based in Philadelphia. He's responsible for a wide range of educational, religious and preservation projects and has led the design of many of the firm's award-winning projects, including a multi-phase renovation project for Temple Adath Israel's well-known synagogue and renovation work at Princeton University. Other recent work includes a student housing project at the Lafayette College and Allentown, both of which we'll be discussing during the course of today's conversation. Sam, I'm curious to know a bit more about your approach to building for communities and people in the wide range of social, cultural, economic and religious contexts you work in. There must be a lot of challenges and hurdles, particularly as there's no kind of one size fits all model in architecture and placemaking. So I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about the types of issues and challenges you face when it comes to creating community spaces in your work. I think uh, community space making has always been very, very important to me. I grew up in the city of Philadelphia in what we call a row house, a 18 foot wide structure with equal size buildings on either side. Um, I spent my entire life in that environment. I went to college, university and architecture school here in Philadelphia. Uh, and as a result, uh, understanding and appreciating the urban experience uh, has been very, very important to me. The notions of public transportation, public access, and uh, fair and equitable housing for uh, everyone who lives in the city has been essential to me. Although we have worked and I am currently working from New Hampshire to Florida, I think the city of Philadelphia, uh, which has been my home and where my livelihood has been based for 60 years uh, it is important to me to make sure that I leave the world a better place than it is today. Yeah, I think it's really important to consider people as being central to architecture and uh, making sure that the places they live in are fully adapted to their needs. Um, have you noticed in the breadth of projects and work that you do, what places have in common? So themes, needs of places. I mean, obviously there'll be notable differences depending on what audiences you're designing for. But have you noticed any kind of common threads, particularly in your your work in Philadelphia? Well, not just in Philadelphia, but but elsewhere. I think the, the common threads are that we are all human. And as a result, we all have basic needs of uh shelter, community, uh, places to socialize, uh, cultural attractions, uh, and fair and equitable educational access as well. And I think one of the challenges for an architect is that we are basically supported by patrons who commission us to do particular work. And I know in some of the other discussions that have been had, where there's uh, opportunities for commissions is typically where we go. But the opportunities to give back through volunteerism or serving on various boards are the opportunities where we have to really support the communities that we best serve. Some of the clients we have, you mentioned Princeton University, University of Pennsylvania, those are institutions that are seventy-five dollars to $100,000 to attend those institutions. We're also doing work for public schools in the city that do not get the same amount of uh, equitable distribution as schools in the suburbs because of the way the taxes work uh, in this particular area. Suburban schools are much better supported than city-based schools. And as a result, you can go to same schools for the same number of students in it. Some have much better technology. Some have air conditioning. Some don't. Some have not been seen a can of paint uh, on the walls in the last 50 years or so. And I think we as architects, if we can give of ourselves in order to make some of those changes and volunteer our time. I think working on public schools for me uh, is not going to be an award-winning commission, but it's going to be something that I feel much better about that I'm going to do our best as a firm to change the lives of the people who attend those schools. And I think that's why I think educational institutions are some of my favorite ones to work on. 
Yeah, it must be really gratifying seeing the positive results that come of some of those projects. Are there any that spring to mind uh, as having been projects that you've thought have been really long lasting and have made that kind of impact you've been talking about? Lafayette College is, is a wonderful small liberal arts college about two hours from Philadelphia North. It is a private college. It is fairly expensive to attend that college. Um, and we've been lucky to have done maybe five or six different commissions there. So the one in particular uh, that we just finished is a 150 bed residence hall for students uh, right on the perimeter of campus. And we are now currently in construction, another 150 bed residence hall. And I think the college has been extremely forward thinking uh, with regards to what we call the town and gown separation right on the edge of the campus that they could have very easily put up a residence hall that was very inward focused and turned their back on the community. And I think the community itself was very worried about that. And the community being many different houses that date maybe from 1890 to 1920, immediately surrounding the college. And most colleges are kind of growing slowly. And I think neighborhood residents are always nervous about colleges growing and absorbing them and uh, not being respectful of that urban context. But what Lafayette did and, and worked with us to commission was that they wanted retail on the first floor, a bookstore that sold local newspapers, uh, magazines, had a coffee shop in it, and then a diner, which was open to the public, not just for students as well. And the building had a front to the campus, but also had a front to the community. And I think the part I like about it the best is that we figured out a way to take this 150 bed residence hall and break it into two forms. Uh, and create an amphitheater between the two structures so that we could have an outdoor space for the public to gather and students to gather for films, music, uh, and other kinds of events that would be open literally 24-7. As regards the assistance by the people of the community themselves, is there is there any assistance as in in addition to the funding you get, are the people for whom you are building, are the people convinced, are they participating, are they... What is the reaction of the of the public? Uh, the whole thing is designed for in the end. I think that's a great question because typically these kinds of institutional projects we do and the campus edges require what's called zoning variances because they're not built as of right, uh, meaning that we can't always conform to setbacks and height uh, and impervious cover. So as a result, every project like those have to go before the community. So the community has a right to uh, not just a right, but an obligation and the desire to speak up and say what they feel is either missing or where they feel challenged or where they feel better opportunities could happen. And even before we got to that point, the college was very good about asking for community participation in the design process uh, along the way. And I think that has been helpful. Um, but I think part of our job is also to build consensus with the community and also kind of mediate between the community goals and the college goals, which are not always uh, in alignment. What are some of the examples of the main challenges for kind of overcoming and bridging those two types of community? Well, I, I think the town and gown issue, which we faced at numerous colleges and prep schools and boarding schools is young privileged people coming into an established neighborhood, issues of lack of parking, issues of noise, issues of trash, issues of alcohol abuse, issues of not being respectful of a strong uh, architectural context and sense of neighborhood. And because many of those neighbors have been there 20, 30, 40 years, have small children, et cetera, they see university and college students as um, sometimes almost as trespassers. And it is a hard time, I think the college has, to educate students that, to say that you're you're really guests here and that you really need to be respectful and supportive. Uh, and I think that's just an issue that many colleges and universities have to face, especially in town and gown border housing. I think that's why usually it's upperclassmen who are on the town and gown perimeter, whereas freshmen First year students, they call them these days, are in the center of campus and, and not exposed to the community at whole. They have to get a little more seasoned before they, they let them out on the on the neighborhood perimeter. Did you work also in, in uh, let's say, more problematic communities as a, where the conditions in social terms strongly differ so from those you mentioned uh, for the Lafayette students, also where there is poverty, where there are drugs, where there's a problematic neighborhood? 
Yeah, those are other issues that I face generally more with the public schools in in certain neighborhoods that are building uh, brand new structures in neighborhoods that are challenged. And I think, uh, you know, I had written of a general concern about urban development and the lack of public schools and some of the issues of that we're facing with regards to homelessness, et cetera. Those are, I once remember as a graduate student, I designed a vocational and job training facility and community center. And my thesis advisor wrote on my thesis, you cannot solve social problems with architecture. And I think I've spent the last 40 years trying to refute that statement. I, in fact, I find that as a personal challenge that that is actually my task to try to to do something like that. So again, I think we can only do so much, but I think if we can't walk away from a commission and say we made that that place, that community, that school, that university a better place than it was before, then I don't think we we succeeded. That's a good point with making the better place. Related to it, based on your experiences, which are the general issues and challenges regarding creating spaces for communities in recent urban contexts? It's a very broad question, I know, but uh, in the direction of Flora's question from the beginning, in all the individual cases, are there factors which can be lined out as common? I think when we think about common factors with regards to community spaces and some of the issues I'll talk about a little bit later, issues of privacy, issues of being in a tempered and conditioned environment, uh, having access to a restroom, uh, access to food, uh, access to transportation, uh, public transportation, access to a job. Those are all things that I think we like to engage people uh, about how they feel those things are are missing and what can be done in order to provide those kinds of amenities. At this park we're working on in, in Allentown, creating a new pavilion, that has been a park that has attracted homeless and drug use, uh, et cetera. And at the same time, this town is evolving from years of being a post-industrial town to being more of a service economy town. And the big challenge there is that when you're an industrial base, you can have finished elementary school or middle school and go right into a factory job. Once those factory jobs disappear, it's very hard to get a service economy job without a college education. And there's a whole community, a whole uh, demographic that's really left behind. And how do you find places for those, uh, those people to work? What I'd like getting involved in much more now and one of the schools we're, we're talking about is a vocational training facility, places for people to learn the building trades, specifically how to do renovation and restoration work, the notion of a stone mason or, or, or brick mason, people who can do uh, carpentry repairs, uh, plumbing, HVAC work. Those kinds of schools have closed down all over the United States. Uh, they've definitely closed down in Philadelphia. Uh, we're trying to create and I'm actually involved in in a community right now where we are working in an abandoned church, a semi-abandoned church that's now been purchased, that we will actually teach students there, young people, 16 and 17 years old, how to take a stone chisel and start to build up. I think, you know, in Europe, you all value that much more than we do in the United States. And I, I think we need to learn from Europe in many ways about the values of vocational training and uh I'm glad to see some of that now with a new mayor coming in Philadelphia, pushing that forward. It's an interesting point. And I'd say in the United Kingdom, it's it's a massive issue, actually, particularly with key heritage skills. There are lots of interesting, innovative ways that people are trying to encourage young people to get involved in those. But it, yes. it's so true because once they're gone, they're gone. And it's, you know, a cultural thing and about the heritage and identity of of communities as well. So really important to keep that preservation alive as well as the kind of forward thinking more innovative ways of of building i did have one question that i uh want to just quickly go back to we we're talking about some of the positive impact that can come out of these projects with um you know the lafayette example bridging between the public domain and then also the kind of community the student community i wondered how you actually managed to track some of that positive change through evaluation or engaging the community at a later date that's a great question i think actually that tracking is going on as, as we speak but i i know that there was enough success from uh feedback that lafayette college got from the community when we got our approvals that we 
had a much easier time getting approvals for a second residence hall uh, than we did for the first. And so, as I say, the second residence hall has advanced, but I have gone back to Lafayette a couple of times now, especially during our construction on the second phase and see both students and neighborhood members sitting generally side by side at the same outdoor bistro tables at the diner shopping in the same bookstore that we designed. And so I see that the realization of having two very different groups being able to share the same space is working successfully. And that is certainly very gratifying for me personally. And I'm sure it's very gratifying for the college because I think uh, for prospective students, knowing that there is not, and prospective students' parents, that there is not a demarcation line between when the college ends and the quote unsafe community beyond begins that there is a much more of a shared resource here it is a win-win for everybody. Mm. And it must be a really good case study if you like to use for other projects you work on to say you know here's the example of where this has been really successful and you can use that to map onto different contexts and, and places as well. Yeah absolutely I think anything that breaks down the borders or the uh, dividing lines between one institution and another and makes it more porous with the opportunities for um, engagement on both parties' uh, sides is going to be uh, much more beneficial. I think, you know, generally the issues of downtowns and, and towns and gowns as industry has moved out of some of these smaller places, Easton, Pennsylvania is where Lafayette College is, uh, Allentown is where the other project is, and, you know, Philadelphia also where University of Pennsylvania is, has seen so much change over the last 50 or 60 years. Philadelphia has lost 600,000 people since 1950 and is only slowly starting to bounce back again. Uh, lost much industry uh, in that time post-World War II. Uh, Easton was also a big manufacturing hub that uh, also uh, lost industry. And so what happens is that the colleges and universities, they become the economic hub in a lot of these smaller towns. And as a result, many people in the community that work in factory jobs now either teach at the colleges or they are staff. Uh, and as a result, their economies are so intrinsically tied together. So it, it is important that the town and gown line is very much blurred because I think what I've seen and I've written about is a lot of these small towns had very uh, active and vibrant main streets and those main streets have really suffered when the factory jobs moved away. They suffered when uh, there have been highway bypasses that take people out of the downtown centers, uh, move them to the perimeter. We you know, had a rise in the 70s and 80s of big box stores. And then with the rise of Amazon and uh, ordering and e-commerce, even that has suffered as well. So I think, again, mostly in the United States, uh, we've seen particular challenges for downtowns and communities and how to support them in a way because I, I think e-commerce is here to stay for better or for worse whatever your opinion is on it and so the downtowns and the shop fronts and the retail spaces constantly have to reinvent themselves uh, in order to stay vibrant and, and be wonderful places that become destinations and how if, if we think maybe about the allentown project how do you create and, and encourage people to find joy in those kind of everyday places how do you get people to get out and about and enjoy the places around them I think in, the, in these smaller towns, especially and finding joy in these you know pocket parks and places like that, there has to be active retail. There has to be places along major streets that allow you to stop and, and appreciate and engage. I think there has to be much more landscape and shade trees, uh, local tolerant plants. There has to be a feeling of safety uh, and welcomeness. And you know, oftentimes that means uh, proper lighting at night. Uh, banners and graphics uh, in order to highlight what the downtowns have to offer. I think the great thing about the Allentown Project, which is this wonderful outdoor pavilion, is that uh, it is on the edge of a park that we are completely re-landscaping. And at one side of the park is the Allentown Art Museum, and the other side of the park is the Allentown Symphony. And those are somewhat I, want to, I don't want to say foreboding per se, but there's many people who don't feel comfortable in a museum and some people who don't feel comfortable in a symphony hall. And we saw the opportunity for this park 
to have a pavilion that became almost like a welcome mat to those two other institutions, the symphony and the museum. The symphony, as can be imagined, is a place where people look at sheet music and they play classical instruments. The art museum, coincidentally, because of the big textile industry that used to be in Allentown is filled with textiles. And so we came up with this idea of a pavilion with a very curvaceous form that both recalls sheet music and recalls textiles. So this building, which just won a, a AIA, American Institute of Architects Award, takes on this very curvilinear form that sweeps to hold a restroom, but also has lighting. It also has speakers, it has a stage, and then becomes the focal point for events, not just for scheduled events, but for the passerby to use it for uh, yoga, uh, for dance, and for other community-based events. So it is really both a, a scheduled feature uh, as well as an unscheduled impromptu feature. And you know, again, we as architects had a great time with it, but it also took a very enlightened developer and a very enlightened uh, administrative staff at the mayor's office to come up with something that will work to engage the community that will really make this a wonderful forecourt and a destination in Allentown. That's really interesting, this idea of flexibility and also how you manage to target different age groups and interests. Something that's yeah, beautiful, I suppose, simple to look at kind of structure, how that then targets more complex nuances of of different interests and um, ideas that people might have in the community of how they want to use that space. D- does that get led by the community then in terms of what they what they want or who kind of takes charge of this space now it's up and running? Well, I think about 90% of the time, it is wide open to the public for general scheduling, and mm-hmm. it can be done through an administrator for the park for general use. The way we also design it is that perimeter fencing can be set up for paid events, for specialized concerts and things like that. So then if you know pay a nominal fee, you can get to see a concert in the evening, and then the fences retract down into the ground and that you have the ability then for uh, community use once again. And I think having those kinds of spaces that can do dual duty like that, both private and in community at the same time, rather than having to duplicate them, I think makes it pretty special. Could this be a general success factor, this combination you mentioned of private and and, and community effort to make something positive elsewhere, so like in the project of, of Allentown? I think it is an emerging model that I think really works well, because I think cities and towns that are generally cash strapped uh, and can't afford to use the tax base to support community endeavors, oftentimes rely on outside developers or uh, even developers that are very much embedded in the community to figure out a way to help them with privatized certain elements, but at the same time, make sure the vast majority of the events are open to the general public. And I, I think that's a model that needs to be encouraged as long as it doesn't come at the sacrifice of a of a particular group. And I think that's just something that needs to be monitored uh, more so, as you said, Flora, the whole notion of how do you do kind of post-completion testing of whether these different ideas work. I think that's something that, that needs to continue to happen. And that also relies on the community being you know, engaged and willing to give their views about things, I suppose, as well. Yes. You started such a monitoring method as a, as, uh, as a, a catalog of criteria or something like that, because it sounds really very interesting, this Allentown project. It could work to make better spaces for communities and, and in the end to make the world a better place, as you said. No? As it sounds really interesting, this approach. Yeah, I think the development of, of a checklist of community input, what were they looking for? How do we meet their needs? And then a year from now, or six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, have we met all those elements? And where haven't we met it? And what could we do differently when we look at other similar projects elsewhere? Can I also ask about the role that sustainability plays in in projects you work on and how that feeds into good design and how you get that kind of long-term impact improving wellness prosperity of people using the spaces and also for the environment and whilst also managing to sustain cultural traditions heritage things like that how how do you bring sustainability into your work no i think that's a, that's a, a very good question very important i think with regards to the kind of town gown issues 
what we've certainly found is that colleges and universities are finding that more and more students are interested in uh, energy conservation and recycling more so than ever before. I think this generation of students has been really brought up with that, whereas in the 70s and 80s, it was less so. And so I think the colleges and universities have started to figure out a way if we want to attract students, we need to have buildings and landscapes that follow sustainable design guidelines. So the project at Lafayette has a major stormwater capture area uh, and native grasses and native plantings to deal with stormwater capture because of, again, uh, climate change and the uh, heat island effect that we're trying to fight at the same time. And I think the notion of photovoltaics, which we're doing on another charter school project, uh, where you have major south facing opportunities and students, you know, can't necessarily see the uh, photovoltaics on the roof. But what we're doing a lot more is uh, dashboards uh, in the classrooms or in the hallways or lobbies so that all the energy consumption is now being done in a monitor and a screen so students can see how the sun's effect and the power uh, use that we're having. We're working in another college right now. We're in another dorm and hopefully in a dorm that we're going to be doing for various colleges or residence halls have their own dashboard. So each student dorm fights it out about who's using less energy. So there's even a kind of competition to figure out who can be more energy conscious. So we really like to see it as a what can we do as a community? Uh, there's a phrase amongst the Quakers that we have here, many in Philadelphia, which is a uh, walk softly on the land. And I think all of our projects, we're really trying to walk softly on the land and have our projects be that way as well and kind of teach that general philosophy. We only have one chance to kind of make a difference. And if we can show the impact that we as a culture are having on the land and what can we do to understand the impact that we're having and make a difference, so much the better. I like the idea of the dashboard and making people really think about energy use and how that can also tie into architecture and the experience of living in a in a space. I think that's that's great. You asked the question about culture. Yes. So I think that's probably another huge hot topic in the United States as well. And uh, DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, it's a highly politicized area of discussion and you can go state to state in the United States and get extremely different takes on it. It's something that's very, very important. And I, you know, we try in all of our projects to make sure there's minority representation, that there's general inclusion. We have a, a young man working for us now uh, who goes to one of the charter schools that we're working on. We've made sure wherever we possibly can to allow the young people at some of these charter schools that haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to mentorship in particular trades like engineering and architecture to have tours through our office, have tours through the engineer's office and see various careers that would otherwise not be open to them. And I think that's really kind of part of the process of designing for your constituents to know that they are not just a place that we're trying to put a, a structure around, but that they themselves should be able to partake and have some pleasure and enjoyment in the process of the design of the construction and even in the potential career that it took to put that kind of structure together. This brings me also to the general AOS philosophy, as a how to address these issues in general, as a your, your approach, your philosophy, how to deal with this uh, as a positive matters in the direction of uh, community generating in the end, like Allentown and, and other projects. Those two locales are very close to us. As I said, we're working up in New Hampshire, which is much colder climate in the in the winter time. We're working in Florida, which is you know over 100 degrees throughout much of the summer and shade uh, is so important there, whereas uh, opportunities for sunlight and warmth is much more than the desire in a place like New Hampshire. And so I think balancing what we're calling sense of place, uh, we would not design a building that looks like it's in Florida, New Hampshire, nor would we design a building for New Hampshire in Florida. That's very iconic and unique architecture that balances issues of sustainability um, and local plants, local materials sourced within 500 miles of those locales. Florida you know, borrows a lot of its architectural culture from Spain, uh, from 
the use of stucco and terracotta roofs and things that are much more vernacular and indigenous to the Florida culture. Uh, New Hampshire, or is it actually much more, at least where we're working from the United Kingdom, uh, use of brick and stone and those kinds of structures. And I, I think the fun for us as architects is that we get to work in those architectural contexts and create campuses that retain the architectural context that that defines them. I think why I love so much designing on college and academic campuses is, is because once you get there, you should really feel that you're part of a community, uh, be it an amphitheater, be it a uh, classroom building, et cetera. And I think having access to equitable education, access to equitable architecture that's energy efficient is, is something that we're all entitled to as people and, and as architects, it's our responsibility really to provide that. I think it's also a cultural issue also to adapt to, to the traditional architecture of the region where you are in. As it could be, as a, we have examples from Europe, as a, where where it really worked with with new buildings adapted to an existing historic context no? in a successful way. No? They reacted to the local culture, these new buildings to the local culture. Nevertheless, and they created something new. <laughs> it was no, it was no not an alienated architecture from the historical context. And this is a really, really interesting approach. Yes. A, if I understood you properly, as a, with this New Hampshire and Florida example, to adapt to the existing, also cultural, local conditions in making new things. Right. The notion of how do you create new interventions into buildings, uh, into communities that look like they belong, but are clearly of the 21st century. And I think that's a, a wonderful challenge. Sometimes we do buildings that look like they've been there forever. And sometimes we do buildings that look like they are new, but I think they share a scale, they share a material selection to look like they, you know, quote, fit in. And I think that's why being an architect is a wonderful challenge because it's not one size fits all. It's not a cookie cutter approach, especially working in an urban context. We specifically don't design work or don't see commissions that are out in a country field somewhere. We don't take a rural landscape or valuable agricultural land and seek commissions to put a new housing development on it. That's really kind of antithetical to our thinking. We like urban density. We like the preservation of uh, outdoor space. And I think, you know, places in Washington state have been reasonably successful about creating a beltway around them to keep the urban core. But in some ways, those have been very challenging because what that's done is just driven up housing prices uh, in the urban core. Uh, again, I think Europe is is better because of the limit of resources about uh, preserving urban density and preserving valuable agricultural land. The United States for many, many years has just felt itself as this boundless place that can continue to spread out further and further out. Um, and I think we've uh come to the realization that our resources are limited and we're not going to be able to do that forever i think you can see the lakes lake powell out west that many places in california colorado wyoming nevada are fighting over water right now that the dams have really uh, made it very challenging to irrigate forever places like arizona have had 110 degree weather for the last 30 days in a row you just uh, you know, there's a great book out that I just read about the invention of air conditioning, which I found fascinating. It, you know, allowed cultures in Brazil and South America to grow, but allowed places like Florida and Arizona that used to just be destinations for wintertime folk to become year round destinations. Uh, and as a result, you know, when air conditioning works, it basically takes the hot air out of a room and throws it out into the into the outside and all we're doing is we're heating up everything around us and it's just it's just unsustainable from an energy perspective from a livelihood perspective and and to the point of this whole conversation community it's the people the uh, unhoused people in los angeles now who are living in 100 degree heat in metal boxes uh with very little water and it's just no way to treat fellow citizens we just we can't do that and it's just uh, something that really needs to be thought about because all it's doing is separating the have and the have nots now this would presuppose an idea of citizenship no? yes what if this very idea is lacking no? so if there is no idea that we all are citizens also not in a formal way but, but uh, 
in a more direct human way. And this, uh, as a, at least uh, me as a non-American, when I visited uh, cities like Los Angeles, for me as a as a European, as a the first impression in terms of citizenship was horrible. Uh, there is no such thing like citizenship. Yes. What's my first impression? It, it is a great question. I think if you ask people on the polar spectrum of the Republicans to the Democrats, you know, what is a citizen and what is citizens' responsibilities, you will get very, very different answers. And, you know, I'm sure you heard the notion if you're too much concerned about social welfare, then you're considered a socialist in the United States. And socialism is, is kind of a bad word. Uh, for many, many people, other people feel very strongly that as a citizen, our role is not just to take care of ourselves, but to take care of the fellow people around us. And it, it is it's dividing the country in in ways like we've never seen before in the politics of the United States, certainly over the last week have put us in a place that I, I've never thought I'd ever see before. It's very unsettling, very challenging, and uh, maybe more so as an architect the importance of making sure that those who don't really have a voice um, can at least be served by what we can do uh, with our quote socialist tendencies those who care about those less fortunate it's it's important to us and should be important to us i'd be interested just to get your overarching reflections on this idea of an ideal space which is obviously what drives our work at ideal spaces foundation applying your approach and philosophy on diversity, culture, preservation, sustainability, some of the key topics we've talked about today, what would you consider to be important for an ideal space? What can we expect that to look like? Well, I mentioned some of them so far already. And I think the notion, probably number one in my mind is safety. And second, maybe is the notion of engagement. I think any kind of ideal space cannot in any way be intimidating and unwelcoming. Uh, the notions of engagement and the opportunities to feel that you're part of something larger. And I think uh, all we're just really kind of talking about demographic and the underserved demographic. I find some of the, the parks in New York City are some of my favorite places to go because it is the most democratic spaces that we have where people of all walks of life really can be side by side. And I appreciate you know, Bryant Park is one of the ones that I love uh, so much, the Tuileries in Paris, what I would consider another one that has a, a varied landscape opportunities for shade, um, shade trees, uh, a landscape that is a uh, bucolic uh, and enjoyable. And those are all kind of outside spaces. I think spaces that have notions for private spaces as well as for a larger uh, gathering spaces are the ones that kind of do the best the ones that you want to go to repeatedly that have enough variation that uh, make you really feel that you're part of something larger and i think that you know no one as a citizen i think citizenship is such a great phrase that you used here no one wants to feel marginalized and i think anything that we can do as architects designers uh, the uh, people who push for ideal spaces needs to make sure that no one feels marginalized in the process. And if we do that, we are successful as designers, creators, architects. And I think, again, about leaving the world a better place. I don't want to ever make someone feel that they are less a citizen than, than I am. And I think that is the most important about being human. Uh, I think you know, we love that. And architecture in particular is particularly hard about that because we are not sculptors we're not painters although i'd love to do both of those things we hold commissions that don't always follow where we want to be so a lot of it comes down to volunteer work and after hours work and making sure that our voices are heard and more importantly that the voices of the marginalized are heard that's what i think the most worthwhile thing is that we can bring to uh, to life brilliant summary and, and a really powerful message to end today's episode on. So thank you very, very much for your time, Sam. It's been really interesting and rich discussion. And I'm sure there's lots for our listeners to take away from it. So thank you for, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.